Today, I'm going to be speaking with uh, Mark Robert Rank, who is professor of social welfare at Washington University in St. Louis and also author of the book Poorly Understood, uh, out now by Oxford University Press. Uh, so great to have you on today. Oh, thanks, David. Great to be with you. So, I mean, let's just jump into maybe what's one of the meatiest uh, uh, diving boards into this topic, maybe, which which are the misunderstandings about uh, the poor in the United States, two of which, correct me if I'm wrong, are the misunderstanding that most poor people don't work and the misunderstanding that most poor people are uh, minorities ethnically or or racially. T tell us maybe uh, how this came about, but also the truth of, of the statistics. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of underlying those myths is the idea that, uh, or the myth that, you know, poverty happens to somebody else, it doesn't happen to me. And so, you know, it happens to folks who don't work or folks that are uh, minorities, um, but, you know, it doesn't really affect me, or it's not going to happen to me. And uh, what we show in the book is that actually, uh, if you look at the major the majority of folks in poverty, are actually white. Um, a majority of uh, more folks in poverty live in suburban areas than in central cities. And some of the deepest seated poverty is in rural America. And the idea that the poor don't work um, is simply wrong. Um, most of the poor have, have worked in the past and will work in the future. And it's, it's really important to think about poverty as something that people go through. They're not poor their whole lives. They, they hit a spell where they have some tough times. They experience poverty. They may be out of work, but then uh, uh, they get back on their feet and they will work in the future. So, you know, I think underlying those ideas is this myth that, you know, poverty is something that happens to somebody else and doesn't happen to me. Uh, there's a, a few different things I think would be interesting to explore. You mentioned suburban versus urban. Is there how can we quantify and qualify the difference between the rural and suburban poverty versus the urban poverty, which maybe is more the caricature of where the myths come from? Yeah. So if you, um, you know, it, it's certainly the case that folks in, you know, inner city, central city areas, um, the poverty rates are higher than the overall rate. But there's many more folks now that live outside of central cities. And so in terms of the number of folks in poverty, you know, again, it's higher in uh, surrounding urban areas as opposed to the central city. And as I mentioned, if you look at some of the most extreme poverty in the United States, it's actually found in rural America. So areas like Appalachia, um, the Deep South and Mississippi Delta, American Indian reservations, the central corridor of California, all of those areas have really, really deep seated poverty. And that's kind of, you know, when we, when we have this image of, of who are the poor, we often think about the poor as, you know, non whites in inner city areas. And it's not to discount that, that poverty exists there, of course. But poverty is much, much wider. The way I like to describe it is that the reach of poverty is really wide, but its grip is is not that strong. People move in and out of poverty a lot. What are the most common reasons that people who at some point were not poor end up in poverty, which maybe is different yeah. from transgenerational poverty, yeah. where you're you're born yeah. into poverty and remain there? Is, is there an interesting yeah. distinction to be made yeah. there? There is. So um, the folks that are um, long term in poverty is about 10 to 15 percent of everybody who will experience poverty. So mm. about 85 percent of people who experience poverty do so for a fairly short period of time. And by short, I mean a year or two. Um, now, why do they experience poverty? It's because things happen to people that they didn't anticipate, like losing a job, a family splitting up getting sick, a pandemic occurring. All of these things have the potential to throw people into poverty for a short period, fairly short period of time. Now, what's interesting about this is I've done a lot of work and the, and the book focuses on this right from the get go of the question of what's the long term likelihood that an American at some point will experience poverty. Right. It turns out that between the ages of 20 and 75, 60% of Americans will experience one year below the official poverty line 
and three quarters will experience poverty or near poverty. And the reason is because, again, over a long period of time, things happen to people that can throw them into poverty. And when that happens, there's not a lot in place to protect them. How how much or is that number at all skewed to um, people in their very early 20s in college who yeah. are, are technically in poverty, yeah. but it's not really reflective of their situation? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and that that's a question that we we often get on that research. And so what we did is we took out um, those folks and oh, okay. redid the analysis and found that it 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 varied. Um, it, it didn't change very much. I mean, the number of people that are actually in graduate school, you know, that might sort of fit that sort of starving student picture, um, is actually pretty small, and so it doesn't really affect the numbers very much at all. Graduate school and presumably college uh, juniors and seniors, right? I mean, 2021. Sure. Yeah, it's so it's rel- it's not a huge it doesn't change the numbers dramatically. It doesn't change that when you again, when you look over a 30 or 40 year period, it really doesn't change it very much. When it comes to the I mean, I, I it may go back before this. Actually, maybe that's a good good question. For me, some of the big historical markers of when the narrative around the poor started to resemble what it is now, I think back to the Reagan era the story of, you know, the welfare taking Cadillac queen having kids in order to get food stamps and money. Uh, how, how far back does that trope sort of go? Well, I think you're right that that kind of the modern version of that really started with Ronald Reagan. But the idea of the deserving and the undeserving poor actually goes back 400 years to sort of England's poor laws um, at the time. But certainly Ronald Reagan was the one in, in more modern times that really emphasized that. And the argument that he's making was making was um, using those stereotypes to argue for smaller government. You know, his, his big line, one of his lines was, you know, government is not the, the answer. Government is the problem that we fought a war on poverty and poverty won. Well, it turns out that well-constructed government programs actually have a very significant effect on reducing poverty. So take the war on poverty. Uh, in 1959, the poverty rate in the United States was around 22%. By 1973, it was 11%. We cut poverty in half because of the war on poverty and because of the strong economic growth during that time. So did we eliminate poverty? No, but it's an example that government actually can be quite effective in reducing poverty. So in, ter- in terms of reducing poverty, I mean, the, the U- there are some uh, poverty inducing factors that are similar around the world, and there are some that are that are less common, you know, medical expense bankruptcy doesn't exist in many countries. It does exist in the United States. So this this may understanding that this may be hard to parse out when we talk about poverty. Discussions often include all of the following and more minimum wage, access to health care, improving education, cost of living, rising wage gap uh, on and on and on. What interventions have been shown to be the most effective at cutting poverty? Well, I think uh, the number one um, number one uh, solution is uh, jobs that can pay a decent wage, jobs that provide a livable wage and also having benefits associated with those. So what has happened in the United States over the last 40 or 50 years is we've been producing more and more low wage jobs and jobs that don't provide benefits. And so a median male worker who is full time in the labor market today is earning slightly less once you control for inflation than he was earning in 1973. There's been a huge stagnation. And that's one of the reasons why more and more people are at risk of poverty, because they're working at jobs that just can't support a family. So I think that's the number one factor that we need to focus on. But as you point out, there are many other factors as well, such as you know having access to health care, child care, good education. Those are all really key elements to addressing the issue of poverty. When we think about um, stimulus like the kind we've seen now three times during the course of the pandemic or a proposal for a $15 minimum wage, which the sort of more free market minded folks would say these are these are artificial 
um, uh, decisions that are being imposed. The minimum wage would be a price floor on labor that might be above what the market would dictate or just dumping a one time payment on people is not really going to systemically change the value of their work to an employer or whatever the case may be. What do we know about the longer term impact of those types of interventions? Yeah, interesting. So first of all, uh, the idea of providing kind of a monthly universal payment to families with children has been uh, going on in European countries for decades. Um, and it's shown that that's really, really effective in terms of reducing the rate of childhood poverty. And uh, in the uh, in President Biden's um, pandemic package, we have a, a version of that where, you know, every family with a child would get three or four hundred dollars a month. Um, so we, we are actually starting to get some research in on the effect effect of, of this type of a of a policy there's a there was a study that just came out from Stockton California that did kind of a universal basic income and they actually showed it had really positive effects and interestingly it actually the folks that were getting the UBI actually had higher rates of employment than those who weren't because that's one of the fears that you know oh this creates a work disincentive actually it creates a lot of positive incentives in terms of people you know being able to live what i often refer to as a livable life the mobility question is an interesting one where there's a bunch of ways to measure how likely it is that if born into poverty, one yeah. will exit poverty. And you can look at this at a country level. You can parse it out by education and race and all of these different things for those who are born into poverty, but get out of it. What do we know about the following generation, the kids of those folks and their likelihood of remaining out of poverty as well? Yeah, so the way I like to think about this is that it's the notion of cumulative inequality. So first of all, as I said, most folks who experience poverty do so fairly short periods of time, but they may not get that far above the poverty line. Yeah. Um, but the way the way we we often like to think about the United States is that there's a level playing field and you know everybody's kind of starting at the same point. And I use the analogy in the book of actually what's going on is a um, modified game of Monopoly. Oh, this is interesting. Now, I, I, I've used this and I think I've used this oh, analogy before. And I'm wondering super. where you first heard it, actually. Well, I, I thought I came up with it. But oh, did you? oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but, wow. But I, I don't know. Probably, let, well, tell you know, it to us because let's see if it's yeah. the same one I use. Yeah. OK, so, you know, we we normally think about a uh, game of Monopoly. We have three players. Everybody starts out with fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. They go around. The rules of the game apply. And, you know, luck and chance and skill um, uh, determine who is going to win the game. But now let's look at an altered game of, of Monopoly where player one starts out with five thousand dollars. Player two starts out with the $1,500, and player three starts out with $250. Now, we're still going to have the same rules uh, and, and, and abide by those, but who's going to win most of those games? Well, given the prior advantages, player one is going to win considerably more, mm. even if he or she is not as lucky or as skilled. Okay. Um, and the other point is that player one can play the game differently than player three. They can take more chances. If player three makes one mistake, it's over. And, and that's what's really going on in this country is we have an altered game of Monopoly where some players are starting out with that $5,000 more and more players are starting out with maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred, and uh, unfortunately, many people are starting out with the two hundred fifty dollars. So we really we need to think about how can we address some of these prior advantages and disadvantages so that we have more of a sense of equality of opportunity, which we often talk about as important in the United States. Right. So we're, we're at the end of our time. But my, so my oh. version of the analogy is, yeah, it's almost the same. It's everybody really does get the same amount of cash. But the late starting players have to contend with all the properties already having hotels on them. Absolutely. And, and so, so but it's it's really the same idea. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, that it, that is. We've been speaking with Mark Robert Rank, professor of social welfare at Washington University in St. Louis. The book is poorly understood, which we will link to um, in the YouTube video for for our conversation today. Mark, really a pleasure having you on. Oh, this was great, David. I really enjoyed it.